Sounds great, Clancy. Jim, Dave, okay. I can hear you fine. Excellent, I think we got everybody. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so welcome to the TMAC meeting. Um, I've been asked to read, uh, this is Clancy Black, uh, TMAC chair, and I've been asked to read this statement to get started. Um, it is Tuesday, July 14th, and it is 12.32 p.m. This meeting will be conducted entirely via electronic means on July 7th, 2020, in accordance with Utah Code 52-4-2074. I determined that conducting meetings of the Provo City Transportation and Mobility Advisory Committee with an anchor location, such as the Community Development Conference Room, presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present there. These are the facts upon which I have made this determination. Uh, Utah has been in a declared state of emergency due to novel coronavirus disease 2019 since March 6, 2020, a disease outbreak which the World Health Organization has characterized as a pandemic. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention state that COVID-19 is easily spread from person to person between people who are in close contact with one another. The spreads through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks, and it may be spread by people who are non-symptomatic. Federal, state, and local authorities have recommended that individuals limit public gatherings, wear face masks, and follow social distancing guidelines. The individuals exposed to persons experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 self-quarantine for 14 days, and the individuals experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 self-isolate to prevent and control the continuing spread of COVID-19. Notwithstanding that Utah generally and Utah County specifically have been moved to the low risk yellow phase, reported COVID-19 cases in Utah County have more than doubled since May 31, 2020. Physical distancing measures will be difficult to set up and maintain in the community development conference room. Uh, this meeting will be available to the public for live broadcast and on-demand viewing at youtube.com slash user slash Provo Channel 17. All right, made it through that. <laughs> um, sorry, everyone, that, was, that, that has to be read in order for us to hold the meeting digitally without an anchor location. Um, so that's why that was needed. Did I cover that correct, Crystal? Anything else we need to cover there? Oh, that sounded great. All right. Thanks. Excellent. Um, so for introductions, I think uh, we'll just quickly introduce TMAC members. Um, and I think I'll just call everyone out if that's okay for the sake of ease. So I'm Clancy Black, TMAC chair. Uh, we've got Joy McMurray, TMAC co-chair. Um, David Arnold, TMAC member. Jim Hamela, TMAC member, and Stephen Manji, TMAC member. Um, and we'll also welcome David Shipley, our city council representative. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Uh, oh, and sorry, Dr. Mitsu Saito, TMAC member. Sorry, Dr. Saito. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll welcome everyone else, uh, numerous representatives from public works and engineering and planning. Thank you all for being here um, and the rest of our guests. Uh, as a reminder, this is, um, uh, stop me, Robert, if I say it wrong, but this is not a public hearing. It's a committee meeting, so it's for the committee's conversation, but we will be inviting some public comment at various places. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's dive into item, item one then. Um, invitation from Bike Walk Provo to do a guided tour of downtown. Um, Robert or Mary, I assume one of you wants to start there. Yeah, we're going to let Mary go ahead and, and do this. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let's see. Okay, I can swipe and see everybody's faces. Um, oh, there we go. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and keep this very brief. Um, I have a short visual presentation for this invitations. I'm going to share my screen if I can do that right. Oh, is it okay if I share my screen? It says it will stop someone else sharing. Is that all right, Clancy? I just stopped my screen, so you should be able to oh, know. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. 
share my screen. Okay. Oh, I thought I had this. Can you guys see this? Uh, Are you guys are... able to see a box that says guided walking tour? No, we're not seeing anything. No. Hmm. Sorry, I, let's see. Okay, let me try something else really quickly. So sorry, this digital business. Okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. Oh no, <sighs> because I'm doing this on my phone, it is being angry. Um, and I was under the impression that you could just share your screen directly on your phone, but it makes you choose a menu of items. Um, Mary, is this I, something you've sent to us in the past that one of us could maybe pull up? Nope, I have not, but I could send it really quickly. Robert, yeah, Mary, do you wanna? Go ahead and send it to me. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, guys. My goodness, no. I thought I was all set. No problem. Okay, it is sent, Robert. Thank you for everybody's patience. Okay. Did you receive that, Robert? Yeah, just one second, and I'm going to share my screen with all of you. Well, while he's bringing that up, just as a introduction, because I don't think I've met most of you in person, my name's Mary Wade. I've been biking and walking primarily for my transportation for a long time here in Provo with my kids. Um, I am heading up Bike Walk Provo right now, for, have been, been for the last year and a half, and it's been a great opportunity to learn more about um, active transportation and, and its benefits, especially for families, um, which, you know, is, is why we've been um, wanting to extend this invitation um, to you all to do this walking tour while we're all in, you know, social distancing and, and that sort of thing. It's um, it's such a great opportunity to uh, slow down the pace a little bit and um, ex really experience the infrastructure, um, literally putting yourself in other people's shoes, especially if you do drive primarily for your transportation. So um, this is just, like I said, a very short presentation. It's, it centers on the difference between uh, what's the difference between walkable and able to be walked? Um, there is a big difference. We'll just look at a couple comparisons really quick. You can go to the next slide, Robert. Thank you so much for pulling that up for me. Here's a good example. Um, and these are all here in Provo of able to be walked. This is on 240 North in Freedom, just south of Smith's and just north of downtown too, which is kind of shocking to me when you think about just the vibrance of the downtown that just a couple blocks north, <laughs> we have such a desert um, for walking, um, you'll notice that the sidewalk there is, uh, there's no buffer between the traffic, the 35 mile an hour traffic and the sidewalk. Um, and yeah, again, it, you, can people walk that? Of course they can, but, um, they're not going to seek that out. It's going to be unpleasant. It's pretty exposed. Um, there's not a, a ton for them to access. Um, so that's one example of how you might notice, you know, sure, we can walk. There are, you know, the technical sidewalks there, but it's just not an inviting or comfortable space, especially if you're walking with kids that, you know, they could trip and then they're just one trip away from that traffic there. It gets a little dicey. Um, so let's look at an example of walkable. This is part, this uh, is on the, the guided tour map. Um, the, one, of, one of the stops there, uh, 100 South, just south of New Skin, just to the east of Freedom. Um, and this is just a lovely example of, of walkability here as far as a clear crossing. Um, 
there's not a long way for for people to be crossing on foot. You can see some great signage there um, for cars to yield to pedestrians. There's a lot of trees and shade and we just love that. We're such social creatures too. We love to have visual interests around us. There's a lot of that provided by the new skin um, landscaping and architecture and of course the beautiful temple there. Um, and you can see that the sidewalks are set back from the road as well. And that definitely increases the comfort of anybody walking. Um, and let's see, we can go to the next slide and feel free to chime in with anything you're noticing too. But again, I, I know I want to just keep this, this brief. This is another example of able to be walked. You can see a person on their bike on the, on the sidewalk there on the left. Um, this is state street. Um, on let's see right by that new maverick just north of di and tragically just north of where an older gentleman was uh was killed walking across the street because it as you can see this is a very long crossing um and he did not cross in time um and and he was killed a few years ago uh but yeah this is this is an example of what some call a strode where there's just it's it's trying to transport a lot of people and have amenities on the side and and it just is very hazardous you can see there's lots of driveways where there's potential um uh conflict points with people walking or on their bikes and people making right hand or left hand turns without checking to see if there's a person there um, again, very exposed, not a lot of visual interest. So able to be walked, yes. Walkable, not, not so much. Um, obviously, wide streets are necessary at, at times, mm -hmm. but um, in, at Bike Walk Provo, we talk a lot about creating um, a, a safe and connected network of walkability and bikeability. It's not that we need every street to look like that new skin street, although that is lovely. Um, it's just that we need there to be a connected and safe network that takes people where they want to go, especially those major amenities like the library and the rec center and downtown and, and other areas that you guys have helped to identify in the, in the uh, master plan. We appreciate everybody's hard work on that. And then another example of walkable, as we know, this is the north side of the temple in New Skin here, downtown. Um, it's just so lovely with again with the shade and I love the visual interest of the um the our historic architecture I think that's what draws a lot of people but also how narrow those buildings are there's something new to see uh at least every 30 feet and with current zoning that's not even allowed anymore we have some uh businesses that are 11 feet wide like written vision and it's just such a quaint and amazing little thing that draws so many people um but those are some of the things we love about, about our downtown. We do regularly see people giving feedback about how can it be more walkable, more bikeable things, simple things like even on the right hand lane there where you see those cars putting Shero markers, which is a bike symbol to let drivers know and bikers know that they are within their legal right to be biking and taking that lane, uh, especially since ordinance does prevent uh, people on bikes on the sidewalk uh, on our downtown center street. So. Measures like that would be very helpful. I've seen also others call for improvements to our, our crosswalks, raised crosswalks and different things like that. Um, that could that could make a difference as well. Um, but okay, am I still there? Can you guys yep. still hear me? Okay, sorry. All right, and then I think this is the last slide here, really quick, just wrapping this up. Um, like I said, there's there's nothing like experiencing the difference for yourself between walkable and able to be walked. We'd really be uh, love to see all of the TMAC members plan a time to take the tour. Um, it'd be wonderful if uh, that was part of a TMAC tour itself, although I know social distancing does uh, create some, some barriers there, uh, or independently, and I did add a, fun quote there from Jeff Speck, which is uh, one of the books that we base this tour off of, the safe, comfortable, interesting, and useful walking, which is we can have the kind of city we want. We can tell a car where to go and how fast. We can be a place not just for driving through, but for arriving at. And I know that's, you know, so often uh, our goal as well in making this safe and connected network. So uh, again, I invite you all to, to take that time and 
um, to, to utilize active transportation wherever possible as well, because it really, it's very eye-opening to, to experience. That is that. Does anybody have any questions? I just wanted Thanks, to Robert. add, oh, Mary, this is the tour I went on with you, right? Ago. Yes, Joy. Yeah. I forgot. Thank you. Shout out to Joy for coming with us. Oh back. no. <laughs> thank you. I wanted yeah. to give you guys a shout out. It was a great tour, and I learned a lot. So thank you for for making yourselves available to give us that tour. It was great. Great experience. Of course. Thanks, Joy. And I would be happy, you know, masked six six feet apart to accompany anybody else who would like to go, kind of have a have a guided tour as opposed to the self guided tour. But we can we can be sure to stay safe. Okay, hey, any other questions? Uh, Mary, that, um, I think you'd emailed the committee a, a JPEG of that tour back in April. So I, I think we all yeah. have access to that. Um, but if it's changed, um, you may want to send us a, a new version of that because I certainly would like to take the time to do it myself. I appreciate you sharing this with us. Yeah, of course. And is that Clancy talking? Sorry, I might find yeah. a yeah, Clancy here. I also wanted to say shout out to Clancy also in helping again with that that connected network, the connected and safe and comfortable network. Um, for Clancy's help on improving uh, that network on um, there's a cross block, there's a like mid block cross path um, on about 450 north and 800 east. That is a wonderful alternate route to connect students, especially BYU students walking to BYU so that they don't have to walk up 900 East. Because again, that's a great example of like, yeah, 900 East is able to be walked. Is it at all comfortable? Not, not at all comfortable, not at all walkable. So um, Clancy helped with this project we had a couple years ago to lay um, concrete on this a mid block path to access 800 east um, from 900 east, and that also connects over to like King Henry and all of that. And that's just such a wonderful, like, it's a tiny, you know, well, it was a lot of work, but it was, it's a very small example of just a very small infrastructure uh, connection to make a huge difference and, and make that network much safer. Give give more walkable choices to people is really what it's all about. So wanted to make sure I give you a shout out for your help with that Clancy because that was that was huge. Oh well thanks. I pretended to be a concrete finisher for a day. So <laughs> it's it's lasted this long. <laughs> it's been we and even in the winter with snow we could see quite a lot of foot traffic and bike traffic on it. Like it's getting used a ton. And yeah. it connects to the west also over to five hundred north on the other side. Um it's it's a great it's a great connection. So anyway, thank yeah. you all very much Excellent. for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Mary. We appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Mary. Yep. Have a good one. All right. Um, we'll continue on to item two now. Um, so continued discussion of possible UVX stop in vicinity of BYU Creamery and Music Building on 900 East and. Uh, sounds like BYU and UTA or representatives are attending. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick review from our discussion last meeting. Um, so the, the idea was presented and um, there were uh, some representatives from nearby neighborhood to share their perspective. Um, there was general you know, positive support for the idea of adding the, the stop um, for the neighborhood's sake and for, for BYU and uh, other reasons as well. Um, we, our discussion as a TMAC, I think in general, we were all, we were all supportive of this and kind of forwarded that support to the council and the administration to consider. Um, I know one primary concern we did have was about um, potential impact to Wasatch Elementary. And so Joy, if you wouldn't mind sharing for just a minute, um, Joy is on the community council at Wasatch and so was able to talk to the principal there. You want to share that, Joy? Yeah, sure. So um, the Wasatch principal just changed on July 1st, but I emailed both the past principal, Jess Hansen, and the new principal, Chris Furman, to say, hey, this is um, go, this is a discussion happening, um, a bus stop going in on 9th East, very close to Wasatch. Is that a concern for you? Would you like to convene the community council to talk about it? 
and um, neither of them were very concerned. They they both sounded supportive and didn't feel the need to convene the community council. So they only said they would like to be, uh, they would appreciate it if BYU would make them aware of the construction schedule so they can know and let parents know if there's conflicts with school drop-offs and things like that. So, but, but neither of them expressed concern about the bus stop. That's great. Thanks for doing that, Joy. Um, I think, I think if this is able to happen, how the design impacts the school will still be critical, but it's good to know that both principals are, are supportive of that. That's, that's great. Um, we also had a letter from the from the neighborhood with, uh, I think, 194 signatures I checked this morning um, of support. But we also have another guest today from the neighborhood um, that we want to invite to share some additional perspective from neighbors. Um, so if I have your name right, David Atchison or Atchison, um, I, I believe you're here representing um, neighbors as well and wanted to share some of your perspective on the proposed idea. If you can hear me, David, you can go ahead and unmute and we'll give you a, a couple minutes to, to share with the group. There we go. I'm unmuted. There we go. We can hear you. Great. Um, my name is David Atchison. I'm the chair for the neighborhood uh, for the Wasatch neighborhood. That is uh, the neighborhood that is that is uh, most directly affected by a bus stop. And my overall message to the committee and also to the administration and it is um, first in my role as a representative of all of the neighbors in our neighborhood and all of the residents in our neighborhood is that. Uh, I, I just want you to be aware that there are two sides. So um, it, it sounds like from a, both a representative and a grassroots way, the information you're getting back says that this is gonna be a great thing. The history is that there was a lot of opposition and I would say it was 50-50 on uh, BRT in general, which is then turned into UVX. So, we need to, everybody in this process needs to keep that in mind, that this is not, that if you're getting a sense that, wow, everybody seems to be on board with this, that's not the case. So there are many people who are on board with it. Many people who are, uh, and I believe that out of those 194 uh, it, it, pieces of feedback you've received, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that not all of those are, um, are residents of the Wasatch neighborhood. I think that they are likely residents of the broader Provo community. And that's great to get that feedback. I'm da just David, to say, can you hear me? Just, just real quick. So the, just so I can be clear, cause I said that um, the letter says 194 signatures representing 92 households from Wasatch, Oak Hills, and Foothills neighborhoods is what the letter Got says. It. Okay. So uh, keep in mind that there are likely 92 uh, residences within those neighborhoods also that would oppose this. So um, my encouragement is that this process moving forward is not a representative process, but a grassroots process, which means let's replicate to a smaller degree the tremendous amount of effort that went into determining where the original bus stops, where the, the, the current bus stops should go. So we need to have a neighborhood meeting. Probably Foothills should have one also. Oak Hills should have one also. But I know for certain that I need to call a neighborhood meeting so that we can get broader feedback from folks that perhaps don't like to write letters or send emails or haven't been aware. Um, and so, and then also from a from a grassroots um, effort, I believe that we need to have Wasatch poll actual parents in Wasatch rather than just the community council and uh, the, the immediate past principal and the current principal, both of whom 
um, don't live in the neighborhood and who weren't there for all of the blood and guts that went into this process when BRT was uh, initially established. So also we have two principals who were available or who, who are available, but who live in the neighborhood and who were principals at the elementary school during the time of these discussions and all of these meetings, um, Catherine Spencer and Colleen Bensley. And I'd recommend that we get their feedback also. So, um, and, to, and uh, another issue is that I believe that there were, I don't know how many studies, extensive studies about BRT in general, and the ninth East stop was included in those discussions. It was determined and negotiated with the neighborhood, um, especially neighbors along ninth East, that there would be, uh, instead of one bus stop on ninth East, that the compromise was, and it actually was recommended by uh, UTA, that there would be a bus stop. Instead of one bus stop, there would be two bus stops, one at the Missionary Training Center and one on 900 North. And that that actually, according to the UTA studies at the time, um, said that that would be most effective, that it would serve the most residents and the, the greater population. So, and according to, as my understanding was, federal guidelines, that for it to be considered a rapid transit system, the stops need to be uh, a mile apart or more. If we actually put in a third stop on Ninth East, then it could compromise that. UTA's probably got some good information on that, but those are answers that um, that the neighborhood would like to see is, does this comply? Does that affect federal funding? So if it does, does that mean that there's going to be local funding um, to make this happen? So all that to say, there's a lot of questions. It shouldn't be a done deal. There is not a consensus that this should happen. And there may be in the end, or it may be a compromise again, but what I'm saying is that this is at least a six month, maybe two year process as I see it to determine if a ninth East bus stop should be in. This is not, let's honey, let's put in a patio this weekend and go to Home Depot and get some, you know, some stones and set something else. This is a, this is a remodel, a major remodel that requires from my, my little analogy here, that requires a general contractor probably, right? It's an addition to your home. It requires permitting, licensing, and it's not just a, wow, sounds like a good idea. Of course, let's give one more access point for people to get on and off the UVX system. So that's what I am encouraging everybody that's associated with this. Let's have some neighborhood meetings where everybody gets notice and that we can have a grassroots information system about this. Let's have uh, Wasatch Elementary School meetings um, as opposed to community council or just principals weighing in, a handful of people. Let's not make this a representative process. Let's make this a grassroots process and get the feedback that, um, that we need to get so that people don't come back unhappy. People don't come back and sue because processes weren't followed. And, and let's take a deep breath and let's take some time to effectuate this change. Let me also say, I think we are going to have a bus stop there. That's just my personal opinion. I am a lawyer and I manage an advertising agency. I have no public transportation uh, background, but I do think that there in eventually there will be a bus stop there. We need to though make certain that all processes are followed so that every member of the neighborhood has an opportunity to weigh in if they wish to. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, David. Um, two, two, two comments and a, and a question. Um, one, we're going to give UTA a chance to speak earlier. So UTA, I, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on David's comment about stop distance. Um, distance between stops. I know most downtown are only a few blocks apart, um, but UTA, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that when you speak in a few minutes here. Um, and I appreciate your comments on process, David. Uh, we definitely need to honor those processes. Um, when some of the neighbors spoke last month, David, they had mentioned that there were s several neighbors that had opposed it in the past, but after seeing it and experiencing it were supportive. Um, 
beyond, you know, I, I appreciate you acknowledging that there are many that are not supportive at this point. Could you provide either now or at a later time details about neighbors' concerns as to why they aren't supportive? Um, I'm putting you on the spot, so you don't need to now. Yeah. But no, no that's okay. Because here's my answer. Absolutely 100% yes at a later time in a neighborhood meeting. Okay. So yeah, let's have a meeting. Yeah, it'd be helpful. And let's do it in September when people are back from, uh, so what's that? Six weeks away. Let's do it after Labor Day. Let's do it when people are back from holiday. And, and yeah, you, will be, you, will be, you will be so pleasantly surprised, maybe not pleasantly, at how many people will be more than happy to share their opinions. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much of a role TMAC will really play in this moving forward, right. but I know wh whoever is leading this process, it'll be helpful to have specific information about why some people are not supportive because we have specific information about why people are supportive. So yes, uh, yep. that sounds good. Thanks, David. It's fair. Any other questions from the committee for David? Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, David. We appreciate your, your thoughts. Um, I think I'll give it to you, Robert, now to have um, representatives from BYU or, and, and or UTA speak i know i guess background first last meeting one of our major questions was a request as a committee was to hear byu and uta's perspective on this so i think that's where we're headed next in the discussion uh well thank you very much for that today we have uh, mary from uta uh joining us uh so mary maybe if you want to take the first round uh, kind of explain what UTA's position is and where we're going. And then uh, we have Ray Bernier and uh, Stephen Hafen, Steve Hafen from BYU. Uh, so maybe uh, Steve and Ray, after Mary has finished and answered questions or anything like that, uh, we could get your thoughts and insight as well. So Mary, you can take it away. Thanks for inviting me. For those of you that don't know me, um, I went to BYU in the 70s. There was a BYU in the 70s, for those of you that didn't know. <laughs> and um, I worked for uh, Provo City in 98 to 2007, worked in city government for over 30 years and joined UTA almost four years ago. I'm the regional general manager over bus operations for Utah County. So I came in near the tail end of uh, the UVX saga, and I have with me today Janelle Robertson, who is our project manager. She's my colleague at UTA, so she can talk about any technical issues. I am a big fan and a big supporter of process, and so I appreciated hearing um, Dave's comments. I believe in neighborhood process, and I believe in hearing from the community, and I believe that UTA is here to serve the community. So we're certainly looking for leadership from Provo City and the neighborhoods and BYU um, as to this station. If you ask me from an operational perspective, then um, I will tell you that we're very much in favor from a purely operational perspective of having that 9th East station. For those of you that have used the UVX system, if you've gotten off at North BYU Station, which is up by the LDS uh, Missionary Training Center, it's a long walk to campus from there. Uh, South BYU is much more effective, but it doesn't get you as close to some of the places you may want to be. Uh, for instance, this moot administration building. So just purely operationally, and I don't think UTA should just operate purely operationally. Like I said, we, we are a service for the community and the context of the neighborhood and the community is always important to me. So I will say the UVX system has been wildly successful. We um, hoped uh, two, three years out to hit 11,000 boardings a day. Year and a half in, we were at 12,000 boardings per day, and that's just prior to COVID. One of the more popular stations on the UVX system is the BYU South Station. It's highly used by BYU. We were, I think the thing that surprised us most is the way that BYU students have taken to using transit, and particularly UVX. 
Um, when we first started UVX, we do an onboard uh, survey a couple of times a year to find out who's riding UVX. One of the things in our last survey, which was last November, we found that BYU is riding UVX a little bit more than UVU students, which surprised us. And we're also seeing an increase in community ridership with about 20% of the folks that are community riders um, outside of the students. So I would be happy to answer any uh, specific questions. And if we get really technical, of course, we have Janelle online and she can, she lived through the whole history. Uh, she was on the project for 10 plus years and um, she can talk to, we, we do have identified where we would put a station in our original plans. If we were to move forward, I assume it would still go in those, those places. We can speak to any of that, whatever is your pleasure. We certainly would be happy to support the neighborhood and sharing any information. We're not going out to advocate for a station without the support of Provo BYU in the neighborhood. Mary, if you can speak to it, I would like to hear what the plan is for where specifically the bus stop or bus stops would go, or is it just one side of the street? Is it both? Is it close to the Taylor building? Is it on BYU property? I, I would love to hear a little more detail on what the plan is. So I, I'll have, Jan, I'm gonna turn it over to Janelle and she can talk to speak to that. I can tell you historically where we thought we would put the stations. Mm -hmm. And of course it'd be presumptuous on our part to not to do this without talking to BYU because it is BYU property. And we've talked generally, but we haven't, move forward on trying to do something. We're not trying to rush to do this. Dave's absolutely right. It's a big commitment. Um, it's an expensive commitment. Um, and it's something we want to be thoughtful about because it will stay there for a long time. So Janelle, do you want to talk to that? Hi. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we do have an, have a, a figure that shows approximately what was planned before. Like Mary said, we have, um, you know, no uh, requirement that it be exactly that. This is just an example. I can pull up the screen real quick if you want me to share and just show what we had looked at at one point. Yeah, that's fine. I'll stop mine. Okay. Still saying I, oh, there we go. So yeah, this is just really preliminary, but just approximate idea. Um, uh, the north or the southbound bus could pull into here. This would be the station platform, and then this would be the sidewalk, the 10 foot sidewalk going around the back side of the station there. Um, the northbound bus would pull into here, same sort of thing, station platform there and a sidewalk that goes around. This one is a little bit more complicated because there's a power pole there with, that would need to be relocated, but um, uh, that that is what was planned at one point. But yeah, we haven't had any further discussions about that, just as an example of, of what we could potentially do here. Do people need orientation for this map? Do you understand where it is? Because I don't know if people know where that is, Janelle. Yeah, so... Um, the creamery is to your right, uh, to the north on 900 East here. And then to the south here is the campus. I think that's called Campus Drive, um, where you go into the uh, kind of roundabout in the parking area there. And I believe that in here somewhere is where the new building is proposed to be. That's correct. I have an image, if you would like it, this is Ray Bernier. I've got an image of the uh, location of the uh, new music building and, and Janelle, your, mm -hmm. your sketch on the uh, west side of 900 East. I've got a sketch showing kind of that approximate location. We double checked it just with our design team to see if in fact it could still fit there. If you'd mm -hmm. like me to screen share, I can certainly do yeah. that as well. Right, stop sharing. Let me see if I can screen share quickly and pull that up. Can you see this image? 
Yes. So this is this is the uh, 930 East along here. Uh, this is Heritage Drive coming in, and there's the access on the north edge to the uh, to the law school music building parking lot. Um, Lynn Schofield, the city fire marshal, asked if there could be an access way in for fire trucks to come off of 900 East in this location and part of the CRC process for the music building. And so we've shown that and our concern was do we have enough ability to get in. This is the location, we put it on this plan just as a test and certainly we haven't reviewed this with anyone. And so this is all just suggestive at this point, just an idea, but the idea that if that location, there's the Northeast corner of the music building. So the music building is all, you know, south of this in a sense, there's a sidewalk that comes off it, a 10 foot sidewalk coming past it as it comes around like this. So that's the idea on this side of the road. Hope that's helpful. Thank you, Ray. That's really helpful. This is David Atchison. Is it okay if I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. go ahead, David. Yeah. Ray, as you know, um, the last round that we went through with our neighborhood was parking and parking spaces being taken by the music building. And um, I, from my opinion, we got to a really nice place with that. Does this affect, does this uh, re remove or eliminate even more parking spaces? Do you know, do you have a sense? Yes, um, so let me answer that question. This is existing curb line, the dashes you see on the north end. This is a reworking of this corner, which was in the plans that we took to Provo City for the music building. Um, this addition is a result of the uh, CRC. The existing curb line is, um, along 900 East is right here. And uh, to be able to get this to work for the fire truck coming in and out, and also for, we think, buses to get turned in here properly, the UVX type bus, uh, we have changed the location or we show a proposal or an idea to change the location of where that curve line would be. It would tie back into this location and it would tie back in up here as well into the existing location. We showed some bollards here, but you can see they'd be out in the drive aisle. And uh, this is multiple ideas on top of each other. But the idea that, and I think the city has asked us to not put these in as part of the music building. We are putting in the concrete as part of that, because the idea that the uh, city fire uh, department wants to be able to fight fires from the north side of the building. And even though you can access the uh, parking lot from the north, and they came over and tested that with their ladder truck, um, they felt that having these two ways in and out would be very helpful to them in terms of that. So to answer your question, my recollection is that this curb line is approximately where it is now. And so this edge right here, that's an existing tree location actually that we're maintaining. We've asked the contractors to protect this tree. There's a couple others like it. This is a new tree, new location, but this is a uh, existing location that we're keeping. There's other landscape through here as well. And you can see those on the plans that we submitted to the city quite a while ago. But David, to your question, these, these parking spaces up here are, are gone because of the idea of the fire access through here. But beyond that, I don't see that the UVX, if we were to do this with UVX, I don't see it as encroaching into the parking area that has been designed into the music building. Does that make great. sense, David? Yeah, that does. That's great. And if you can continue to sound that theme, that'll be great for the, that'll help the neighborhood. Okay, very good. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. And certainly parking has been a big issue and we understand it. Ray, this is Clancy here. So you, uh, to make sure I understood that sort of in the bottom right of your image, that cross hatched area, that's where you're saying you kind of just put that in as a test to see if you could fit the UVX stop there. Is that, did I understand that correctly? That is correct. We had uh, Meridian Engineering, who's been the engineer, civil engineering on our project, and they understand, you know, the sizes of buses and all those kinds of things. They worked with us closely and all that in the past as well. But they felt that, uh, and they understand the kind of the sizes of the UVX because Janelle Robertson and I worked very closely on the stations associated with camp, especially on the uh, on the 900 North location. So we have an idea what those are. So we shared that with the civil engineers, and so they came in and 
put in this crosshatch area, as you asked, Clancy. And uh, yeah, that's that's an approximation. And again, uh, we're not trying to be the architects for it. I think that's uh, that's up to Janelle to decide what she wants to do. We just looked at it to see in the context of its relationship to the music building. Is it too close? Uh, can you get a bus in and out of here appropriately? Stopping distances, those kinds of things. We think that this is is a good approximation. But again, if design actually does, if this gets approved, then I like all the processes that you've been talking about here today. And certainly we'd love to participate if, you know, on either side. If this thing doesn't go, we understand we're, we're supportive. If it doesn't, if it does go, again, this is BYU property. Part of this is BYU property. Now realize that there's a centered lane, uh, so to speak, that is unmarked in the 10 foot sidewalk and the city owns from that line outward currently to the curb, BYU owns from the center inward. Mayor Curtis, David Graves and others were part of that decision-making as we decided to expand that sidewalk back a number of years ago. So when you can see it, it's slightly on the BYU property here. You can see that, but in the context of it, um, we think this is a good approximation, Clancy to answer your question. Excellent, thanks, Ray. Janelle, this is Joy. I have another question for you. Could you speak to um, David's question about the length between the bus stops, the north, the north BYU stop to this more central BYU stop to the south BYU stop, what, what those would look like? Um, yeah, so there is no, no requirement, so to speak, of spacing between stations. Clearly you don't want um, a bunch of stations very close to each other in low density areas. But as you mentioned, you can see that in you know, downtown Provo, it's a high density area. The stations are much closer to each other. So there, there's no requirement that way. Um, I think the location of the stations at BYU were a result of that process that we went through with the neighborhood and getting them, getting their perspective, um, not a solely operational um, decision. Um, we did have the station um, in this location originally because it was a, a it made sense um, from a spacing perspective. Um, but the changes we made were um, very much as a result um, to make it work and make it work for the neighborhood as well at the time. So, um, does that kind of answer your question? Or yeah, do you know? Are, are we looking now at half miles between stops? If you don't know I'm that off not the top of exactly head. sure of the measurement between Okay, them. okay. I could I could uh, get that information and, and let you know. Again, Joy, this is Mary. Um, we certainly see the ridership. We're usually driven by ridership. We are attracted to ridership. Uh, certainly the numbers um, that are going to BYU would tell us that it makes sense to have a station there just from a numbers alone perspective. Yeah, every time I ride UVX, it seems very busy at both of those BYU stations, certainly. Clancy, can I ask a question of Mary and Janelle, kind of going off Joy's question? Um, Janelle and Mary, is there any operational concern with putting an additional stop on 9th East of how that might interfere or operate well with the the two existing stops are there any any reservations any concerns or would it be just fine the only concern i have from an operational perspective is making sure that the stations are designed so that the buses can get in and out of the traffic flow ninth east is a problematic area for anyone driving uh not to speak of a, a very large bus and so my only concern is that it's designed in a way that we can get in and out of the traffic flow. And, and certainly um, Janelle did a lot of work on that, although we elected not to do that station. So we have some good ideas of, of what to do there. Um, we think it, like I said, seems logical because of the numbers of people that are writing. Thank you. Um, Clancy again here. I have a question. Maybe this is for Ray. Um, the drawing you're showing, the music building is on the, the bottom of the drawing, the south. Is the music building changing that 
I think it's Campus Drive that leads to the roundabout, or is it between what we see here and that road? Is that road staying as is? Um, the uh, the Campus Lane is uh, staying as is, to answer your okay. question directly, other than we're going to be putting a turnout um, side lane, so to speak, on the north side of Campus Lane. Um, I don't have the drawing here in front of me that I, I could show that to you, but we did have them with the city, and I'd be happy Lancy to get the drawing and then share it with you. But the idea that there is a turnout lane as people come, let's say they're coming southbound along 900 East, and they come down to the campus lane and they turn into campus lane. Uh, maybe I should try to pull up an aerial map if you would like me to and be able to see if we can show what we're talking about just uh, using Google Earth or something. I saw one up a minute ago. If someone yeah, wants Robert, to. Robert has one, don't you, Robert? Yep. Let me just share. I'll, I just stop share. There you go. Clancy, I'll say this in an approximation. So if we could zoom in to the law school area there, and I'll pull up on it a bit there. As you come down along that right turning lane on the southbound, there you go. As you turn that corner, that corner is staying intact. You can see there's a bit of an offset that occurs within the first 100 yards or so. We're going to be carving into that and allowing for a drop-off zone we explained this in the uh, in the planning commission type meeting so people understood it in terms of traffic flow and parking needs and things of that nature. But we think we could fit four to five vehicles uh, regularly into a zone right about where that arrow is, each side of that arrow for another, I don't know, 40 or 50 feet each side. And uh, that's the only real change happening within the campus lane. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Ray. Hi, I'm Mitsu. I have a question to Ray. So the new music building has a parking garage under the building, like the engineering building? I know it does no, not. No, not engineering building. Not the the life, life science does. Yeah, that yeah, that's right. has parking uh, in the building. Also, yeah. GRCB, I think, is the building over on the west side of campus. Actually does have below-grade parking, but the uh, music building does not. No, we have not designed a parking below the building. Oh, okay. So, uh, what was your uh, kind of estimation, sort of, um, how the the people who might have parked in these two two rows or three rows, uh, where are, do you think uh, they will park? <laughs> uh, that's an excellent question. We actually have a. Uh, transportation demand management uh, study yeah. that has been submitted to the city and is now a public document. I'd be happy to send you a copy of that. I'd want to have Steve Hafen approve me doing that, but I, and he's on, but I certainly be happy to share that with you and with this committee. Yeah. You can better I, understand what's going on in that area. Although it is a city document, you now have it. So but I'd be willing to help you with it in terms of the parking and answering your question. Uh, we looked at a variety of issues in the area and certainly uh, the strategies, like uh, if UVX were put here, we believe through the TDM that it could help reduce the demand of parking in this area. But we're That's also sure. thinking there's a number of strategies that we've just agreed to, and the mayor signed it just in the last day or so, uh, the, the TDM agreement. And the idea there is that how we're going to manage the parking on major event nights uh, north of the building. So the northern portion of that parking lot would still be there. In terms of the people that are being displaced in this area when the building is finalized, we're actually working on some other adjacent parking areas that are in future projects that we hope will help recoup some of that parking. But we also understand that there's kind of mixed feelings with people in the city. Some people would rather see us reduce parking and some people would rather we didn't. But at the same token, I think as we work through other future projects with the city, we ought to kind of figure out where is that all going to go and how we deal with it. The east side of campus, and I know I'm getting deep into it, Mitsu, but the idea on the east side of campus, there seems to be uh, less parking than there is way over on the west side of campus because some of the uh, more sports-oriented facilities that are over there. And so part of this strategy seems to be that as we looked at distances of walking, five-minute, 10-minute walking distances, it seemed appropriate that we could have people parking in other zones. Now, much of this parking area is either A, parking, which means it's for faculty and staff, 
and a lot of the parking lot, especially on the east side where that drive aisle is right down the middle, on the east side of that is a lot of graduate student parking. And so Nathan Summers is not on this, but he was involved in the planning commission with us. And the discussion was that he's uh, the chair of the traffic and parking committee on campus. And they're looking at uh, currently ideas of how to distribute more G or graduate student type parking in the area so that they can be accommodated appropriately. So I think that's still a moving target, Mitsu, in terms of where those G stalls are going to go. But I know that they're working hard and coming up with answers for that. Great, thank you. I explain. Um, it, Ray and Steve, anything else you want to add as far as BYU's perspective on a, a UVX stop along this area? Um, I think uh, as I was preparing uh, and a team of us were preparing for the planning commission meetings, one of the questions that I did ask of our administration uh, was, are we willing to participate in UVX along this area in terms of the land issue? You know, in other words, will BYU be willing to designate some land and probably in similar type agreements? And Janelle, I don't know the specifics. And we actually have one of our campus attorneys, Chris Bauer, is on this as well. And he may recall, because I know he was deeply involved in that. So perhaps, Chris, if you want to talk about that, you can. But I, I asked for permission to talk about this in planning commission. And it was granted with the idea that, again, we, we went into planning commission saying, we, we understand Dave Atchison's position that there's people in the neighborhood that may not be in favor of this. And there's other people that may be in favor of it. And we didn't want to become the decision maker on that in a sense. We're not going to champion the cause. That's really for others. But we're willing to participate. We do think it'll help the area. We do think it'll help the music building. But uh, the idea that there could be, you know, land that BYU would then put on the table. So, and again, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but we do have others on here like Steve Hafen, who's now um, coming in to be the AVP for our university administrative vice president. You may want to speak to this more accurately than I can at this moment. But the idea by the Taylor building, I think it would be on BYU property. I showed a little bit of an, in, an indication on the sketch I had that if it stayed north of the music building, it would most likely be partially on BYU property. Let's say for some reason he decided to put it down by the ROTC south of campus lane instead of north of campus lane for some reason. And again, we haven't worked with anybody yet designing this stuff um, other than a long time ago with Janelle. But there could be options that ought to be looked at with regards to it. Hope that helps. Thank you. This is uh, this is Steve. If I can just chime in really quick and just just add to what's already been said, I appreciate uh, the perspective that Ray has provided. I, I would just say, at a very general level, um, BYU has been extremely happy with the partnership with UTA and the outcome of UVX generally. And uh, we also, I would say, are very very supportive of the process that multiple people have talked about and. And uh, as Ray just stated, BYU is not in a lead position here, but will very much uh, be at the table, be willing to support. I think we're generally very, very positive about the aspect of an additional station uh, on 900 East. And uh, so overall, you know, we are uh, excited uh, about the discussion. We'll support the process, we'll be at the table, and we'll contribute where appropriate to, uh, if the decision is made to to add these UVX stations. But uh, that's where I'd say we're at as a university right now. That's excellent. Thank, thank you, Ray and Steve. I know that was one of our, whether we said it out loud or not, that was one of our major questions. So that's really good to hear. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, do we have any other questions for UTA or, or BYU? Um, from the committee or, or staff that we want to bring up right now. Yeah, <clears throat> just out of, out of interest, how would it be paid for? Um, how long will it take to find, if um, the community agrees and we get it all designed, how long will it take to find funds and get it constructed? What, what does that part of it look like? I'm happy to, to address that if you'd like me to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> um, there's, there might be some interesting opportunities for funding uh, based on some COVID bills that have been passed, some legislation. There might be some infrastructure money that's new to us 
we would first have to figure out a design and the cost. And while we were doing that, we would certainly explore uh, opportunities for federal um, participation and what that might look like. So that would have to be a joint venture between Provo City, BYU, and UTA to, to work on that. I had, Clancy, I had just one more thing I wanted to mention. I'm sure um, BYU and UTA are, are wonderful representatives are aware, but um, that sidewalk coming down 9th East towards Wasatch is part of our safe route to school. We do have children walking through there. We have a crossing guard there um, across from the creamery at that crosswalk. So I'm sure that one of the things parents at Wasatch will want to know is that their children will um, that the safety of the children will be maintained, even as we have giant buses coming in and out, potentially right there by the Taylor building. So just something to keep in mind. Um, I'm sure that I'm sure you're aware of um, that, that that will be one of the topics I imagine that will come up at, at the neighborhood meeting. Thank you, Joy. For, oh, I was just going to say thank you for uh, bringing that up. We don't do stops along 9th East on any of our buses. And we certainly, we do go through a lot of neighborhoods that have these kind of impact and safety is a priority for UTA. So we certainly would want to focus on that. And um, I'd love to, if this were to come about, I would want to do a joint safety program with the school um, to make sure we educate um, on both of our sides how to most safely have a station there. Thank you. May I provide a little bit of information? My recollection in Janelle, if you would like to correct this, but uh, my recollection is that along the east side of 900 East by the Taylor building, that uh, to the point you're asking, Joy, is that uh, we looked at the idea, could there be a separation wall that would have the 10 foot sidewalk go beyond the station to the east so that pedestrians walking through there, be them you know, little children that are going to school in the morning, that there's not this crossing of paths with people getting on and off of the uh, UVX as well. And uh, my recollection is, and you can see there's a wider drive aisle on the westernmost portion of the parking just south of the Taylor building. But my recollection is that it would impact those parking stalls. They would most likely have to move to the east to be able to allow for the 10 foot sidewalk to divert its way around. But we agree, and it was one of the talking points in the past, and that is the safety of those children is very paramount, very important. So I think a design has to respond to that appropriately. Thank you. I know my seven-year-old will want to stop and look at the buses on his way to school. I'm sure he would like that. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an interesting idea because I, I agree with Joy. I don't. I personally am not as concerned about you know, a, a, an, a crash incident where a child was hit. I, I, sorry, I'm very concerned that no children get hit. <laughs> but the, the more likely scenario that um, seems more possible is a child accidentally going the wrong direction and ending up on a bus. So separating or something like that. Um, very interested in some sort of plan to that effect. So I like that, that general idea. I just want to say from UTA perspective, we want to do everything we can to ensure safety of children. Um, and the separation sounds really attractive to me. Certainly we would also, if a small child caught on the bus, I promise you that our operator would be calling the dispatch uh, to, to find out what we should do. But I really like the idea of the separation. That sounds really positive. I like that too. Um, All right. Oh, go ahead, Robert. I was just going to say, Clancy, since we have Mary and Janelle with us, Mary, would you mind just giving a quick update about the Central Corridor study? Um, I think the TMAP members would be really interested in that. And we can have a further discussion later on, but maybe just kind of let them know what's going on with that. Yeah, that would I'd be love to. Um, that's an exciting project. And I think Eric Rasband, you're still on, Eric? Yes, I'm here. Eric is our project manager for the Central Corridor Transit Study, and I'll give just a real high-level overview, and then Eric can chime in. This is an interesting project. Pardon? Sorry, maybe tell them first what that is. 
Yes. So, so what central what the the highest ridership bus that we have in Utah County was the 830, which is now UVX. The second highest ridership is the 850. The 850 is the bus that traditionally runs up and down State Street from Provo to Lehigh. This uh, Orem City gathered together all the cities from Provo to Lehigh and said, hey, UVX is going great. Let's get together and talk about our next potential bus rapid transit project. And um, so the Central Corridor Transit study was born out of those meetings. It's a very exciting project to me because it's, it comes from the community saying, we're interested in seeing this service improved and that's the right way to do transit in my book. Another interesting twist to Central Corridor is that the, the corridor that we traditionally run on is on State Street, which is a state facility, belongs to UDOT. And we are fortunate to have Eric Rasband, who is a wonderful partner, uh, who is our project manager. So it's interesting that UDOT is the project manager on a transit project. We love the partnership of UDOT, UTA, and the cities together. Um, we're in the middle of looking at alternative routes. And by this fall, we expect to be able to say this is the, the routing that we need to do in order to qualify for federal funding, and also just to do good planning, you have to look and say, where should the, the bus route go? And so we're knee deep in that process. Provo City is very engaged and very involved. And uh, I'll turn it over to Eric, if you want to add. I, I have a graphic that we could share if, if possible, um, just to kind of talk about the alignments. And You should be able to share that, Eric. It says the host is disabled. There we go. Can you see that graphic okay? There we go. Okay, so um, we have, uh, you know, up here at the north end, we, we feel like uh, here in Lehigh, we're gonna tie into what's going on with uh, the Point of the Mountain study and the redevelopment commission that's occurring up at the Point of the Mountain. Um, at this point in time, it appears that that study is, is really going to end here at the Adobe location. Um, we're evaluating a couple of options through the Lehigh area. Um, one is to tie into um, this Adobe station along the rail route or to take State Street and some of the lo local connections over to the Lehigh front runner. If we ended up with this red alignment, we would evaluate an option probably in this area to come over and connect um, across I-15 um, from that, that rail alignment over to the front runner station. Then generally um, through the southern part of Lehigh and American Fork, um, Pleasant Grove, uh, the State Street corridor is, is pretty much the corridor, maybe a little deviation here on Pacific Drive in, in the downtown American Fork area. At uh, North County Boulevard, all of the communities are a pretty high agreement that North County Boulevard is a, an important corridor. So we're, we're turning um, down that. And then here in Linden, there's three options um, through Linden, Vineyard, and Norham. One is the State Street corridor, just continue down on State Street. Another one is to take Geneva Road or the, to 800 North. And then the final one would be um, Geneva Road over picking up the UVU vineyard campus um, that exists um, and then across state north and then through Orem down through North Provo State Street is is really the option 500 west is State Street in, um, from this US highway it's US 89 um, we have the hospital um, generally in this area um, got the development up at 1720 um, 500 north and then here in the downtown area there's three or four options that we're evaluating. Um, our primary alternative we're looking at is Fifth West, past the, the new city center area uh, and uh, North Park, um, and then to Third South and across over to University Avenue and crossing over the, the existing rail line over the viaduct at University Avenue and then coming back into the front runner. Uh, we understand Provo's work looking at some options of grade separation over the railroad. Um, one of the options that they've uh, talked about is here at Fifth West, um, continuing over, and then we take to, take it over to 920 South. 
this option um, kind of builds into maybe a spur over to the, the airport in Provo uh, or maybe down Center Street out to the airport. Um, there are some options that would be dealt with at a future date, but looking at opportunities to uh, bring in and tie into the downtown center um, and the businesses and provide more transit options to uh, the downtown area here in Provo. Um, but we, we feel like that hospital is a very important um, generator. I, I think the hospital might be the third largest employer in the county. Um, and so it, it's a very important um, location for us as we're, we're evaluating this option. Uh, as Mary stated, this has been a great partnership with all of the local governments. Um, it has been driven by the local governments, and uh, we're just working with them to, to hopefully understand their vision as we move forward. So are there any questions? Eric, I have a question. Could you, um, since we're all very familiar with UVX at this point, could you speak to how the purpose and motivation for this route is is different and how it's serving these cities in a different way? Yeah. So um, Mary talked about the two different, or the, the two highest ridership routes. UVX is by far and away the highest ridership route in Utah County, the, the 850 is the number two ridership. Um, the UVX is really driven by the student population. Um, and this 850, this north-south tr trip is really more driven to the commuters. Um, so it'd be connecting the Silicon Slopes area, um, business, uh, the that Pleasant Grove, American Fork area, the downtown districts. Um, Pleasant Grove is turning out to be an a version of Silicon Slopes with all the businesses that are in that area off North County Boulevard. Orem has um, big visions of redevelopment along State Street with high density nodes, um, mixed use development, and basically 1600 North, 800 North, Center Street, 400 South, um, 800 South and University Parkway, um, trying to build um, transit oriented developments in that area. Vineyard um, has a area really right here where the cooling ponds used to be um, for Geneva Steel. That area is the, the downtown district of the town of Vineyard. It's currently dirt, but uh, they have a lot of plans. Um, they're, they're projecting putting about 40,000 residents into the, that area of Vineyard. Um, it's an area similar to the size of downtown Salt Lake City. So they're talking high rise um, buildings, multi-use apartments up high, um, residential down low, and maybe even some office in the middle. Um, so lots of, lots of options available to us. Um, the land use, the growth that is occurring in Utah County. Um, if you look at Utah County and compare us to all of the other counties along the Wasatch Front, you can take Salt Lake, Davis, Weber, and even Cash. And over the next 30 years, Utah County's growth is going to exceed all of those counties' growth combined. Um, so we're, we're changing the way that Utah County has been. Um, it's going to become one of the economic drivers of the state of Utah. Um, I'm, I was born and raised in Provo. And there's a part of me that's excited about where we're going, but a part of me that wants to see the old Provo. Um, so... Uh, you know, it's just part of, we're, we're dealing with what's happening right now. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I, I'm, this might be a little bit of a premature question, but if you choose the route that goes along State Street, would you then do some kind of spur to get over to Vineyard, or would you try to connect that with UVX somehow, or you'd, you'd find some other way to include it, I presume? Yeah, that, yeah that's those are it, yeah, if we can't answer that question today, um, Mary, something that Mary's been very focused on is whatever we deal with with this central corridor study uh, and whatever the outcome of this study is, is, it cannot be the solution for everybody. And and uh, at the end of the day, we need more transit than just this alternative. And so uh, there likely are going to be following studies and, and projects that implement more transit in the county again. We're gonna add about a million people in, in the Utah County area, um, become, will become the size of Salt Lake County. 
um, by year 2050. Um, and so we, we, in order to accommodate that growth, we have to have more options available as we grow. Thank you. And I love the inclusion of the hospital. I think that's been one of the most glaring emissions in our transit plan for a long time. That's great. Yeah. And the and the <coughs> sorry, the airport. The airport. Me. <coughs> so, sorry. Yeah, I, I want to echo that the hospital and, and <coughs> whole Cougar Boulevard area. Uh, great to link that in. Um, on that note, was was the Riverwoods area and there's there's housing commercial and business in that area was it ever part of this conversation or was the was it primarily just focused on the state street corridor because I love this idea and it connects everything yeah. but I feel like Riverwoods is still that out there would love to be connected somehow we actually have a bus that goes out to Riverwoods um uh, and have had one for a long time. It's not a part of this project. It, I always tell people this project can't answer all of our, right. our concerns. Um, mm -hmm. However, the connectivity of these different projects, like Eric said, um, is really important. I would like to say the 850, which travels up and down State Street, during our COVID um, service, we, we reduced our service almost 50%, and then we're gonna bring back some service in the fall as the students come back. However, that's really been interesting how many people use that service. We just did a survey um, at UTA of people that are currently using transit during COVID times. 37% of our folks that are using transit have no other option to get places. And I believe that a lot of um, essential workers and people trying to get to work are using our 850. And so it's been interesting to watch how that ridership is, has been um, popular during this difficult time. Thanks. Thanks for uh, providing. Actually, I have one question to Mary. Uh, the vineyard uh, station for front runner, uh, do you have any idea when that might happen? You had the plan, right, to have a Yes, station very there. soon. Very soon, within the next year, probably. Right. Um, it's um, it's underway right now, and there's funding available, so that's happening. And one of the things that we're paying attention to is we have a lot of students that live in Vineyard, and we don't have buses that go to Vineyard. We will be mm -hmm. doing our first bus stops in Vineyard starting in August. Oh, it, this towards August. the end of August. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so while the station is being worked on, we're certainly going to be running buses. So right now, if you're a student and you have a student pass from UVU or BYU and you need to get to Orm Front Runner or UVU or BYU, you have to take quite a hike to get there, but we'll be picking them up in the fall. So we we work very closely with Vineyard. They, they're yeah. a very transit-friendly community. Right. And the one uh, is a Vineyard station, you know, the, I was looking at the Central Cordo around, around that area. You can have a shuttle between the front runner vineyard and the one on the State Street. So rather than the the the, the, the BRT coming down to the vineyard station and go back to State Street, it might be a kind of long detour there. But if there's a shuttle, then probably it's it, well, then we can have a parallel. Route. It's something. There's something. Some problem on the front runner people can use the BOT, so they help each other. You sound like someone who belongs in transit. <laughs> Those are good comments, thank you. Those, right on. You used to Absolutely. be a transportation professor. Oh, <laughs> BYU, I know remember? you, I know you. <laughs> I came to your class, right? Yeah, right, right. What if I present, yeah, yeah. no wonder you're brilliant. Stick <laughs> well, around, we you know what we're up stuff. to. Yeah, please <laughs> weigh in on the Central Corridor. Nice yeah. to see you, Professor. All right, thanks. When, uh, right. what's the, do you have any updates on when the front runner, the South stations will come alive, Springville, Spanish Fork, Payson? Is there any new timelines on any of them or any new information? Not a timeline, but we are just entering, uh, we're gonna select an RF from an RFP for a consultant to do what we're calling South County Transit Alternative Study. And we're gonna be looking at 
Um, what I like to say is let's not wait till we're ready for front runner. Let's grow into our transit, get people ready now to use transit. So that's oh. going to kick off probably in the next month, six weeks. And all the cities from Provo to Santa Quinn are involved in that study. So we're going to sort of vet that out. Um, we are also in August going to be increasing our service from South County. We have a bus that comes every 30 minutes in peak and then 60 minutes off peak. And we're going to be doing 30 minutes all day. And one thing we know is when you provide more service, you get more riders. So we certainly saw that on UVX, right? So we have six times the amount of riders by providing that high frequency service. When you don't have to think about a schedule, you can go out and get on. It can tell your, your, your thought about this. So we look forward to seeing what we learn in South County. I would uh, add, you know, we've, we're, we're seeing a small blip in, in ridership right now with COVID and, and the impacts that that's having on um, ridership. But I, I honestly believe that's small in the grand scheme of things. When we get this under control, people are going to return to transit in droves and, and uh, this is going to become a, a much needed mode as we move forward. Yeah, I agree. Doesn't he sound like a transit guy, not a <laughs> highway guy? I love the partnership between UDOT and UTA that what we're interested in together is how to help people move effectively. And it's nice to work together like that. Yeah, we certainly appreciate that. Um, given the time, I, I think if everyone agrees, we'll table item three from the agenda for next meeting. That's our working project and we can easily move that to next month um sorry we clancy to... we'll get to it eventually yeah that's all right it's okay <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we'll have more time but um this is important um any last questions we've got a lot of uh, great people here with us any final questions while we have them or should we go ahead and adjourn i'm not seeing any all right i could well, start a fire by asking about um a another freeway stop in Provo, but I won't do that today <laughs> given the time. Uh, yeah, let's table that. <laughs> okay, well, um, I want to say thanks to all of our guests today. We are very grateful for your, your time and the information you've provided. Um, I'll, I'll have one, one last question here for, for probably Robert or someone else from staff. So, I mean, last month we kind of forwarded our recommendation to administration and the council that were supportive of this this 90 stop and excited about it. We think it'll be good for the city. Um, we need to make sure we follow the process, but I, I think knowing that BYU and UTA are both supportive and on board, I think that recommendation is the same. Um, do we need to do anything additional, Robert, um, or what will what will happen next? And, and will we need to be involved? Um, I think that uh, the administration and council knowing that they have the support of TMAC is really important. I think that it probably from here, it goes to more administrative slash council discussions with UTA, BYU. Uh, those are the kind of the major players. And then of course that very robust um, neighborhood process, mm -hmm. kind of getting that information out there and then then really proceeding. But that that kind of stops my information level associated with my pay grade. So I don't know <laughs> okay. if um, uh, Gary but, has any additional information or anything like that. But you know, I think at this point, uh, it was really important for us to get TMAC's impression of where this would go. And Robert's right, we'll now take it administratively, work with uh, UTA, work with BYU, and uh, look forward to coming back in you know, a few months to talk about uh, any progress that we've made in ideas and options. That sounds good. So I guess we'll we'll wait here when when our input or support is needed again for this. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody. Um, appreciate your time, and we'll we'll see you next month. Meeting adjourned. Thank thanks you all. We'll see ya. Thank you.